Hey there, nation, and welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Cheapskate, and we are back with another episode of From Hell. This is our series of battle reports that is dedicated to our Reign in Hell campaign uh, made by Snarling Badger Studios. So in case you're tuning in for the very first time, uh, two uh, YouTube war gamers, Adam Loper of Tabletop Minions and Vince Venturilla of Warhammer Weekly, have actually joined up together to create a demonic combat skirmish game called Reign in Hell. And the company that they formed is called uh, Snarling Badger Studios. And so we've been actually doing a lot of battle reports with this series because you want to try out the campaign system as well as demonstrate the gameplay because it's a very fun game, very high paced action pack, and very brutal. So we're doing a little campaign with this one. So this is battle report number five of our campaign. It is an extracting power scenario that is fought between Lords of Hell as well as Judges. Big Puka is playing the Stygian Legion, his Lords of Hell Cabal, while my friend Smells Like a Breeze is playing the Verdant Tribunal Herd. Uh, judges Cabal. So we're going to play some background music real quick as the music is playing. We'll show you guys photos of both Cabals as well as their rosters. And if you want to see exactly what they're bringing for this one, go ahead and pause and take a look at your own leisure. So that being said, let's get this battle report on a roll. Alright, so the scenario rules for this one is extracting power. Pretty much the players set two pieces of empowered terrain on the battlefield. Uh, since there's only two of them playing on this one, they have uh, four pieces of empowered terrain. The victory conditions. The game lasts five turns and the winner is the cabal who extracted the most souls from the terrain when the game ends. So pretty much this is how the empowered terrain works. Uh, how it pretty much works is that the terrain itself is basically possessed with untamed souls. And when a demon moves onto contact, uh, instead of fighting, they actually roll 66. And for each five up they get, they earn one soul. From that piece of terrain. On a roll of one, however, demons suffer two damage during that extraction. Now, no more than one demon per cabal can attempt to extract souls from a piece of terrain. At the start of each round, you roll a d6 for each piece of empowered terrain. On a roll of one to three, nothing happens. On a roll of four to five, though, all demons on that piece of terrain suffer two damage. And on a roll of six, all demons on the terrain suffer four damage and are removed from the terrain as well. And of course, the surviving demons are set within six inches of the terrain piece, but no closer than one inch to it. So that's what it's basically about. You're kind of rushing around the battlefield trying to extract souls from the train as quickly as possible. Now for your rewards. For each Cabal that rolls a d6 for each soul that they extracted by the end of the game, uh, what they do is you roll for each of your souls and on a 5-up you gain that and keep it while the rest of the souls kind of went away because they were too unruly or too crazy or they were basically tainted and you couldn't use it. So with the terrain rules as well as the scenario rules over with, let's go and talk about the battle plan real quick. Alright, so let's talk about the battle plan real quick. As you can see, my friends are playing on a war cry sized uh, table. We have four pieces of major terrain on the table, and as you can see, they're represented by those little warp stone tokens from a war cry to represent which of those pieces of terrain are empowered. As you can see, my buddy uh, Big Puka is deployed on the bottom left hand corner, while my friend uh, Smells of Febreze is deployed on the upper right hand corner. Now, I was talking to my friends about this for their plans. Pretty much for the most part, my friend Big Puka, his plan is just to kind of swarm across the table as quickly as possible, try to achieve, uh, try to get grab objectives and extract as many souls as possible. And the reason why he feels so confident about it is because his Lords of Hell uh, Cabal is primarily kit out for close combat and also to be very offensive, which kind of matches up what he talked about his uh, with the kind of composition of his Cabal, so that's pretty much his plan on that one. Now for my friend Smells Like Fabri, she plans to play a little bit more defensively. She plans on sending her forces to the top two pieces of the terrain in order to extract, extract souls from there, and then once she occupies those pieces of terrain, her plan is to basically just hold those terrain pieces and to uh, extract as much soul as she possibly can. So with the battle plan over, let's go ahead and talk about deployment real quick. So starting from my buddy Big Puka with the Stygian Legion, his Lords of Hell Cabal. In the back left hand corner, that is Abaddon, his leader demon. He's a warrior class leader demon. He's got combat masters as well as unyielding essence. He's got two up to his life. He's also got the Soul Strinker uh, artifact, which basically means for every combat roll of six up, he earns, uh, actually causes two damage and also gains one life. And he also has Imperious Nature, which means that before his enemy attacks, he subtracts one from their combat score. 
Up in the top left hand corner that is Skull Taker, that is a devout demon which is the Lord of the Pit. He's got the Fly Special Rule as well as a Worthy Sacrifice as well as uh, Righteousness Special Rules. And he also has the Essence of the Skirmisher which gives him a 3 plus movement when he does running skirmish attacks. Now right beneath him uh, he's got actually one of his Slaughter Fiends that is Sanguine. Right next on the right hand side is his Tentacle Beast. That guy's name is Skull Smasher. <clears throat> Up in the front the point there that is a uh, Cabal which is one of his Mephets. Right next to him on the right hand side, uh, that is Shabriri, which is one of his lesser demons, which is a spine demon. On the bottom right hand corner, that character is called Abdiel, which is his armored demon. And then right behind them, you have two more uh, slaughter fiends. You have Skinner as well as Crimson Chaos. And both those guys are slaughter fiends. And that pretty much makes it my friend Big Puka's deployment for this one. So moving up to the upper right hand corner of the battlefield, this is the Verdant Tribunal, which is the Judge's War ba uh, Cabal that my friend Smells Like Fabrice is playing. So starting off in the very back corner, that is Durthu, her devout demon who is an executioner. He has the Off With His Head, a special rule, as well as a Justice Game mechanic. He also has the Essence of Luck, which means that he can replace one combat role with a six when he wants to as well. Now right dab snack down in the middle, that is Dryka, his leader demon. She has the uh, Breaking Rules ability, as well as the Warrior class. She's got Combat Master special rule. She's got the Steadfast Soul, which means that when she's in focus combat, one of her dice automatically becomes a six, and she has a hammer of thunder, which is really important for that one because for every roll of six she gets on that one, she causes all enemies within three inches to suffer two, need, uh, two damage, which is actually quite impressive. Now, next to Drake on the left hand side, that is Treekin, who is a lesser demon, he's a slaughter fiend. And uh, right in front of him is one of the uh, lesser demons, is a tentacle beast, I believe that is Willow. And then right in the center, that is a Mephet named Spite the Stormbringer. She's a Mephet with a Stormbringer uh, title. And then right next to the right hand side, that is Ash and Birch, which are two more tentacle beasts. And that makes it a deployment for the uh, judges from the Vernant Tribunal. So with the uh, deployment over with, we go directly to the top of turn number one, and my friends roll off their activation dice to see which of them will be going first. Alright, so that takes us right to the top of turn number one, and these are the activation dice for both the Lords of Hell as well as for the Judges as well. So you can see they got a really good lineup of different numbers they have there. So for his very first activation, my friend uh, uh, Big Puka decides to activate Cobal, which is his Mephet. His Mephet does a uh, basically a charging attack going directly into the first piece of terrain as well, at the same time also suffering two wounds as well, which is pretty brutal, and at the same time not extracting any souls either, so that part was kind of tragic for him. For his next activation, Big Puka then sends Skull Smasher, his tentacle piece, who does a charging attack directly into his terrain piece as well. And as you see, this photo also suffers three damage because every single time you roll a one, you take damage from the terrain piece that you're extracting souls from. So that part was kind of sad. However, even though he did take damage, though, he did manage to secure one soul from that terrain piece. So right now, the Lords of Hell are leading with one soul on the battlefield. And then finally also activates uh, Skull Take, the Lord of the Pit, who basically just flies up the left-hand side of the battlefield over the terrain piece, heading for the uppermost terrain piece on the top of the battlefield. For Smells Like Fabrice's activation, she sends one of her tentacle beasts up to the left-hand side of the battlefield, heading to the topmost terrain piece in order to try to secure that one. And she does exactly the same thing, sending one of her terrain beasts. I believe that is the one who's actually got movement 7 on her gang. Yeah, that's Willow. Willow is the only one who's up there in the front. Uh, she moves up normal 7 inches 4 because she's the slowest of her tentacle beasts because she suffered a twisted injury, I believe. So Big Puka gets actually a couple of activations next. So the things he ends up doing is he sends in Shabriri, his spine demon, sending him directly down the middle between all the terrain pieces. Looks like he's sending him forward in order to secure some terrain in the top portion of the battlefield. At the same time, I believe that is Sanguine, his uh, Slaughter Fiend, who also moves in for support. And same thing with Shabriri, his, uh, uh, sorry, not Shabriri, I'm sorry, Abdiel, his armor demon, moving to the right-hand side as well, trying to secure those bottom uh, terrain pieces there. At the same time, he also sends one of his Slaughter Fiends up forward as well, trailing right behind the Lord of the Pit, uh, Skull Taker. Smells like Febreze then sends one of her Mephets forward as well, which is Spite, uh, the Stormbreaker. She moves up forward to secure that terrain piece. I believe she did a running skirmish attack, I believe, but she was unable to score any souls or take any damage, so nothing much happened there. And for the remainder of his activations, uh, Big Puka then sends up Abaddon as well as, I believe, Crimson Chaos, which was the last of his Slaughter Fiends. Uh, they just move up in support as well, getting it look like they're taking the offensive, securing that bottom right-hand train piece on the battlefield. So with all Big Puka's activations over with, uh, Smells Like Fabrice has the rest of the turn. She sends up the rest of her forces. As you can see, she sends up one of her other Tentacle Beasts as well as her leader, Draika, getting ready to secure that top right-hand uh, terrain piece there. And then finally, a tree can her slaughter uh, fiend as well as uh, Dirtha the Executioner. They move over to the left hand side in order to secure the top left hand side uh, terrain piece. And with that, that pretty much makes up all the activations as well as the end of turn number one. 
So here's another shot of the entirety of the battlefield at the end of turn number one. As you can see, the Lords of Hell are actually moving up forward pretty quickly, securing the bottom half of the battlefield and trying to secure those terrain pieces. At the same time, as you can see, the uh, Verdant Judges are also moving along the top, top half of the battlefield as well, securing terrain pieces uh, accordingly. And I forgot to mention, I did forget to take photos of the terrain uh, that was actually generated. Uh, my friend Smells Like Fabrice, she actually raised, raised two souls from the terrain pieces that she attacked uh, during the first turn. So right now, the uh, Verdant Judges are losing two to one uh, at the end of turn number one. So turn number one over with, we go directly to the top of turn number two. My friends will offer activation dice as well to see exactly what happens to the terrain pieces uh, for turn number two. All right, so that takes directly to the top of turn number two. And this is, uh, uh, of course, the activation dice that both the Lord of Hells as well as the judges have for both their warbands. You can see their numbers there. At the same time, you can also see that the terrain pieces have little D6, orange D6s on the top of them. And that's to represent the effect that those terrain pieces have, because remember, at the beginning of each round, you roll a D6 to see exactly what happens. So unfortunately for the Lords of Hell, for their two terrain pieces down the bottom, uh, they actually got mad, uh, six on the left-hand side, which means they put four damage on any demons that are on them. They also get kicked off the terrain piece as well. And on the bottom right-hand corner, I think that one puts two wounds on directly onto the demon that's on that as well. So whereas for the judges on the top, they actually had no effect for their terrain pieces, so they're perfectly fine. So you can see on the effects on this one, Skull Smasher now is up to seven, uh, five wounds with, with the, the damage, sorry, seven wounds with all the damage that he's actually suffered. So that guy's actually pretty close to death because uh, Tentacle Beasts only have uh, nine lives uh, for them. So that part's pretty crazy. And not to mention that he also gets kicked off the terrain piece because the possessed souls on that terrain piece basically just kind of push him off. At the same time, Cobalt also suffers two damage as well on his terrain piece, which is really bad because um, Mephets only have seven life and he's already got four of them put onto him. So things are not looking really good right now for the uh, Lords of Hell. So with the effects of the train over with, we go directly to uh, Big Puka's very first activation. So for his very first activation, he activates Cobalt. Cobalt does a running skirmish attack directly on the top left-hand corner of the battlefield, attacking that piece of terrain, and at the same time generating some dice. At the same time, he also think takes two more damage as well, so he's actually one damage away from actually being killed. And by doing that, he also secured another soul point for the team as well, so that'll bring up their soul total up to two points. Meanwhile, Smells Like Fabrice also does running skirmish attacks with both her, her, her Tentacle Beast as well as her Mephet, Spite the Stormcaller. Uh, they both attack their individual pieces of terrain, also suffering some damage as well. Uh, the Tentacle Beast actually takes one point of damage, while Spite the uh, Stormbringer also takes two points of damage. But by attacking those two terrain pieces, they also manage to score two more soul points with them as well, so that brings their grand total up to four for this round. So Big Puka gets to go next for a couple of his activations. Uh, one of his first actions is to take Skull Taker's Lord of the Pit. He moves him up his max movement allowance right behind Cobalt, so that way he can start securing that top left-hand uh, corner terrain piece. At the same time, he also activates Skull Smasher's Tentacle Beast, who does exactly the same thing. Basically, he just basically sends his entire movement climbing over the wall, so that way he can make his way directly to the top left-hand corner. Meanwhile, Shabriri, the Spine Demon, though, he attacks that terrain piece down the right-hand corner doing a running skirmish, attacking and then backing off. He does take one point of damage for his efforts, but at the same time, he's also able to secure some soul points as well for his warband, bringing it up to a grand total of five points. And Big Puka also activates Abdiel's Armored Demon, who basically moves to the right-hand side, getting ready to intercept any of the members of the Verdant Tribunal, or trying to plan on come around the right-hand flank. And Smells Like Fabrice goes next, doing a running skirmish with uh, Dreka. She does a running skirmish directly towards that terrain piece on the upper right-hand corner of the battlefield. She takes one damage for her uh, pro troubles, though, but managed to take two more soul dice from that as well, also bring up their grand total to six points in total uh, for their efforts. Big Puka then activates one of his uh, Slaughter Fiends, who moves up forward in order to give some support to Abdiel to reinforce the right-hand flank of the battlefield. And at the same time, Smells Like Rebri sends one of her Tentacle Beasts to attack the terrain piece on the upper left-hand corner, scoring herself some souls from that one. And at the same time, Treekin, the Slaughter Fiend, also moves up his Magma Maximum Moon Lount to put some security as well as reinforce the left-hand flank. And this, of course, brings up her grand total for her souls to 7 points, making her firmly in the lead for this turn. So for the rest of the turns, uh, pretty much as my friends are moving their fighters into position to get into better uh, offensive and defensive positions. Uh, first of all, uh, the last of the Slaughter Fiends, as well as uh, Abaddon, also moves up for the Lords of Hell in order to start their assault on the right-hand flank. Dirtha the Executioner moves over to the left-hand side of the battlefield to help secure the Judge's left-hand flank. And finally, the last of the Slaughter Fiends moves up to the train piece, so that way he can start attacking during his next turn as well. So with all the activations over with, that pretty much ends turn number two for this one.
So here's where I'm show the entirety of the battlefield at the end of turn number two. As you can see, the force are starting to now polarize to the upper left-hand corner and bottom right-hand corner of the battlefield for both sides as well. As you can see, the uh, Verdant Tribunal is actually taking the lead right now with seven, uh, sorry, sorry, seven points of souls that they've harvested, while Big Puka as well as the Lords of Hell have managed to raise five points as well. And at the same time, the Lords of Hell are actually taking kind of a little bit of a beating because that last turn with the activation of the train pieces, a lot of their guys actually took some damage, which is actually pretty crazy. So the end of turn number three over uh, two, or sorry, end of turn number two over with. We go directly to the top of turn number three. My friends roll off their activation dice. At the same time, we also roll off for the train pieces to see exactly what the effects are. All right, so that takes directly to the top of turn number three. And as you can see here, these are the actual dice that we actually have for each of the members of both war bands. So you can take a look at their activation dice. And that's again, once again, we're starting to see the, um, the effects taking place for all the train pieces. So for the very top left-hand corner one, I believe there's no effect for that one. Same thing with the bottom right-hand corner train piece. Whereas the upper right-hand corner and the bottom left-hand corner train pieces, they roll a five as well as a six. But luckily for both parties involved though, nobody's really on those train pieces. So no one suffers any injury from those. So with the uh, effects of the train over with, as well as the activation dice order, we go directly to our very first activation. So the very first game of the uh, kill the game actually takes place. Uh, my buddy uh, Big Puka goes first. He activates Skull Taker, who does a running skirmish attack directly against the Tentacle Beast Willow, uh, not Willow, uh, Birch, which is located there on the top left hand side. Uh, basically just does a running attack, just kind of jumps up on him, nails him, and balances back at exactly the same time. So just like that, nets himself his very first kill, and that Tentacle Beast will need to roll up on the Soul Loss table to see exactly what happens to him. And by landing that kill, the Lords of Hell have also uh, secured their very first Soul Dice, and this one actually ends up being a 5, so all things pretty good, all things considered. Big Puka then goes next again, activating Shabriri. His Spine Demon does a charging attack directly into Treekin, the Slaughter Fiend. And that actually was a really good attack because with that impaling charge combat ability that Shabriri has, he actually gets to reroll three of his combat dice on this one. So in the end, I managed to put seven wounds directly onto Treekin right off the bat, which is really bad because um, Treekin only, only has 10 lives, so he's got three more life before he's actually killed. Now, granted, he does have an execution right behind him, though. But uh, the Lords of El actually have numbers in this battle report because there's so many of them. They actually have nine members of the Cabal. While as the uh, judges, though, they only have uh, six, sorry, seven members of the Cabal that they can only use uh, for this battle report. Big Puka then activates one of the Slaughter Fiends, which does a charging attack directly into the terrain piece in the left hand corner. And he does exactly the same thing with Abdiel, his armored demon, charging the terrain, doing a charging attack on the terrain piece in the bottom right hand corner and also suffering a wound for his troubles. But by doing this, of course, they also managed to secure two more soul points for their Cabal, bringing their soul point total up to seven, which basically puts them in tie with the uh, judges from the Verdant Tribunal. So, Smells Like Febreze goes next. She does a running skirmish with Treekin, who basically puts three wounds directly onto uh, Shabriri. The Spine Demon actually goes back the maximum movement allowance in order to break contact with that Spine Demon. And then she sends in Dirth, who does a charge attack directly against Shabriri. Unfortunately for her, though, her Executioner did kind of flub her rolls a little bit on that roll, so because that, she's only put two damage uh, directly onto that guy as well. Meanwhile, the Stygian Legion goes next, so Big Puka then activates Abaddon as leader. Uh, he basically does a charge attack directly into another one of the tree, and I believe that was Willow, which is one of the uh, Tentacle Beasts. Not only does he manage to land those attacks, but also manages to massacre that, massacre that character and basically slay her right off the bat. So because of that, that uh, Tentacle Beast will need to roll up on the uh, Soul Loss table to see exactly what happens to her. And at the same time, I was able to secure another Soul Dice as well, and this time being a 6 on the value on that. So right now, the Lord Tell are doing really good, taking off those offensive attacks uh, directly against the tri Verdant Tribunal. So for Smells Like for Breeze's next activation, she then activates uh, her Mephet, Spite uh, the Stormbringer, does a running a skirmish attack directly onto that terrain piece, managed to secure some souls, but at the same time, though, also taking two wounds at the same time. But by doing that, that also increased her soul allowance up to 8 points, so right now she's still currently in the lead, uh, leading by 1 point, though, for the scenario. Big Puka gets a couple of more activations, setting up his two Slaughter Fiends to move up directly to the center of the right-hand flank, uh, putting us a support for Abaddon, so that way he's not fighting the rest of the uh, Verdant Tribunal alone. Meanwhile, Smells Like Febreze sends her very last Tentacle Beast over to the left-hand side, getting ready to flank Shabriri the Spine Demon by doing a pincer attack directly on against him, with uh, Dirthu attacking from the front, as well as the Tentacle Beast attacking from the side. And for a very last activation, Smells Like Febreze activates her leader Draco, does a charging attack directly into uh, Abaddon. As you can see here, uh, this is where you can actually see the danger that uh, Draco actually possesses. Now, Draco is actually kitted out to kill. She's a warrior for one thing. So because of that, she gets Combat Master, which means she gets uh, basically one of her combat attacks 
automatically becomes a six. So that's one thing that she actually has going for her as well. She also has Steadfast Soul, which means that whenever she's in a focus combat, she also gets that one, uh, one die that turns to six as well. Now, the reason why that's important is because she has that Hammer of Thunder uh, weapon. And basically, whenever she rolls a six, all enemies within three inches suffer two damage as well. So in the end, she was able to put 10 points of damage directly onto Abaddon. Abaddon only has 17 life, so because that drops him down to seven, clearly cuts him almost more than half with his close combat attack. But because that other Slaughter Fiend is also within three inches of the attack, uh, he also suffers two points of damage as well. So because of that, managed to put the hurting on these guys right off the bat. Dryka is actually one of the hardest hitting leaders that we actually have in this campaign. And so, as you can see in this picture, man, she brings the pain when she needs to. And for Big Puka's final activation, he activates his Tentacle Beast Skull Smasher, who just moves it right behind the Lord of the Pits uh, Skull Taker to lend some support to the upper left-hand side. I'm thinking, I was talking to my friend about that, I was like, why are you bringing your most wounded uh, demons up to the left-hand side? And his plan, of course, is to have Skull Taker do all the fighting, but if Skull Taker should take any damage, uh, my buddy Big Puka's plan is to then use Worthy Sacrifice in order to sacrifice these wounded guys to kind of heal him up, and that's the reason why he's doing that. Which is kind of brutal when you think about it, very ruthless, but very much in, in line with the theme as well as the narrative of the Lords of Hell. And with that, that takes a look at the end of turn number three. So here's an overhead shot of the entirety of the battlefield. As you can see, the actual, it's actually kind of interesting. You're having seen, you're starting to see polar opposites taking place on either corner of the battlefield. The Lords of Hell are actually taking quite a beating with their wounded guys in the upper left-hand corner. Or at the same time, the bottom right-hand corner, though, the Lords of Hell are actually taking the offense of taking out two demons in the bottom right-hand corner. So it's kind of like you got like this kind of weird, you know, rounding effect taking place on the battlefield. At the same time, during the end of this turn, however, the uh, Verdant Tribunal is actually leading by one point the number of the souls they have. However, the Lords of Feldor are leading the number of kills, killing two demons this last turn as well. So with turn number three over with, we go directly to the top of turn number four, and my friends roll out the activation dice for their different uh, members of their Cabal. At the same time, also roll the, for the train effects for this turn. So with that, we go directly to the top of turn number four, and these are the activation dice that my friends have actually for each of their warbands, so you can take a look at that. At the same time, you can see the D6s being rolled for all the terrain pieces. Uh, pretty much what ends up happening is that no effects take place in the top left-hand corner or the bottom right-hand corner of the battlefield. However, for the terrain piece in the bottom left-hand corner, though, they rolled a four, so I believe that Slaughter Fiend takes two points of damage. At the same time, in the upper right-hand corner, they roll a five, but no one is currently occupying that piece of terrain, so no harm, no foul there. However, like I said before, that Slaughter Fiend in the bottom left-hand corner, though, he does manage to take two points of damage for that. So, with the terrain effects over with, you go regular to our very first activation for turn number four. So, for her very first activation, Smells Like Febreze activates her leader, Draka, who does a focus attack directly into uh, Abaddon. Manages to kill that guy right off the bat, and at the same time, put two more points of damage directly onto the other Slaughter Fiend because of the Thunder Hammer ability. Like I said, uh, Draka from the Verdant Judges, man, she fights, she hits hard. She's a character killer right off the bat. So not to be outdone real quick, my friend Big Puka does exactly the same thing, doing a running skirmish with Skull Taker. He runs up, manages to finish off Treekin and kill that guy at the same time, bounce back at exactly the same time. So feeling pretty overconfident, my friend uh, Big Puka then decides to activate both Skull Smasher as well as Cobalt. Those guys do running skirmish attacks uh, to the top as well as bottom train pieces on the left hand side. They do skewer some soul points, but unfortunately though at the same time they both get killed from the train pieces uh, fighting back. So you can see on this one, they actually brings their soul total up to 9 points now for the number of souls that they managed to harvest so far from the Empowered Terrain. At the same time, also netting another uh, soul die, this one being actually a 2. Meanwhile, Durthu, of course, does his attacks directly into Shabriri. Unfortunately for my friend, Smells Like Febreze, though, she kind of flipped her rolls on this one. However, though, she was able to kill him. The reason why, because she was only one point away from actually killing off Shabriri. So she burned off her soul die that she actually got from uh, actually killing off, um, what's his name? Uh, killing off Abaddon, which is the leader of the uh, Lords of Hell. So she used that to finish off Shabriri at exactly the same time. So you can see in this photo, she also managed to secure one point of, uh, what you called, of uh, justice points for her executioner, so that part was kind of cool. At the exact the same time, she also managed to get a soul dice from killing Shabriri, which brings her grand total to uh, a two on that soul die as well. Now, if you're wondering about the earlier soul die she burned, it was actually a five that she got for killing Abaddon, but like I said before, she used it to substitute one of her combat rolls in order to finish off Shabriri. So Big Puka goes next, he then activates Abdiel, his armored demon, who does another direct attack directly into the terrain piece that he is manning. At the same time, as to bring up his soul total up to 10 points in souls that he's harvested from the battlefield so far. And Spy the Stormbringer does another running skirmish again for her train piece, attacking and then backing off again. She does suffer two wounds for her troubles. 
but manages to capture enough souls to bring a per grand total soul, uh, soul total up to nine points uh, for the uh, Vernon Tribunal as well. So the rest of the turn is dedicated to Big Puka as well as uh, one more activation for Smells Like Febreze. So you can see in this photo what ends up happening is that Big Puka sends in his Slaughter Fiends uh, going doing charging attacks directly into Draika. They both manage to put 11 points of damage onto her when it's also then done. At the same time though she does send in her last Tentacle Beast doing a charging attack directly into one of the Slaughter Fiends and actually brings up his wound total up to I think 4s ended up being for that one as well. So a little bit of back and forth taking place here on the right hand flank of the battlefield. And for Big Puka's very last activation, his third Slaughter Fiend, he actually has him do his movement to get off that terrain piece, so that way he doesn't get affected if the terrain piece should turn hostile uh, during the beginning of the next turn. And that pretty much ends the turn for this one. So here's where I'm going to shot the entirety of the battlefield at the end of turn number four. As you can see, things are not looking very good right now for the Verdant Tribunal. They've lost a lot more demons in this last turn as well. At the same time, the uh, Lords of Felrock are leading the attack in soul dice to the grand total of, uh, of uh, nine po uh, 10 points, while the Verdant Tribunal only have 9 points as well. And at the same time, her leader's taking a beating. The only thing she really has left really are is one of her mafets, a Tentacle Beast, as well as her Executioner, while at the same time, a large portion of Big Puka's Cabal is still alive and well. So with turn number four over with, we're going to record the very last turn, which is the top of turn number five. My friend rolled their, their activation dice, at the same time roll the effect dice for each of the terrain pieces. So we go to the top of turn number five, and these are the initiative dice for the activation for all of my friends and as well as their players. So here's their numbers. At the same time, they also rolled for the effects of the terrain. As you can see, three of the terrain pieces had nobody on it, so they didn't have to roll for those too much. But for the one terrain piece that is occupied, which is occupied by Abdiel, the armored demon, they rolled a one, so there's no effects, no harm, and no foul. So the terrain effects over with, we go directly to our very first activation. So we go for a couple of activations taking place here in the middle of the table. What ended up happening is that uh, for the first saw, one of the Slaughter Fiends uh, managed to fin finish off Drake and managed to kill her, so that part was kind of sad. The Tentacle Beast did, of course, did try to do a counterattack, but unfortunately for them, though, was able to do much of anything. And at the same time, the last of the Slaughter Fiends kind of flubbed his role against the Tentacle Beast, so not much really happened there. And with Draca being killed, of course, they also secured another Soul Dice, and I believe this one was a 3 is what they ended up happening. So now they have 4 Soul Dice for the Lords of Hell uh, being gathered so far. At the same time, I also believe they also get a, yeah, one of the other fighters, I believe it was this fighter here down below. I believe he also teched that terrain piece as well, earning another Soul Die, bringing up their grand total to 11 Souls harvested so far. Meanwhile, uh, Smells Like Reason activates her Spite, uh, the Stormbringer, her Mephedi does another running skirmish, and bringing up her grand total to 10 points of souls harvested from the terrain. And Abiel does a focus attack directly against the terrain piece as well, also suffers another point of injury from uh, harvesting the souls, but at the same time bringing up his grand total up to 10 points so far for the, uh, sorry, not 10 points, I'm sorry, 12 points so far for the Lords of Hell. So Smells Like Febreze goes next, she then activates Dirth through her Executioner, does a charge attack directly into the terrain piece in the upper left hand corner. Uh, he does take two wounds for his trouble, but unfortunately for Smells Like Febreze though, she was only able to generate enough souls to bring her grand total to 11 soul dice in total. And that pretty much makes the very last of the activations for this turn. So that takes directly to the end of turn number 5, and here's already a shot of the entirety of the battlefield. As you can see, a lot more members of the Lords of Hell are still left on the table. At the same time, they also managed to secure 12 souls from the terrain for the very last turn, while at the same time, though, the Verdant Tribunal only managed to score 11. So with that, that takes us directly to the end of the game, with the Lords of Hell pulling out the victory on this one. They managed to win this scenario by actually harvesting one more soul from the terrain pieces than the actual Verdant Judges. And this battle was absolutely brutal, with a lot of vicious combat taking place between both cabals after all both leaders were also killed in the scenario so it was very very intense so that being said ladies and gentlemen we're going to directly to the post game and talk about exactly what happened to each of the cabals because this battle report is now officially over so first of all talking off with the verdant tribunal for soul loss four members of this cabal were killed we have Drika. she basically got a no effect on her soul loss so she's perfectly fine at the same time, Willow suffered a weakened effect, which means she's minus one to her movement. Birch originally rolled Atrophied for her, so she's going to actually lose two points to one of her stats, but uh, Smells Like Forbidden decided to burn up her last soul dice in order to re-roll that, that effect, and they rolled a no effect instead, so because of that, Birch is perfectly fine. And same thing happened with Treekin with no effect as well. Now from the rewards, they rolled a D6 for each of the souls that they captured from the battlefield, bringing their grand total up to four bonus souls that they got. Unfortunately for her though, when she rolled from the rewards table though, she received no rewards. Same thing with titles, advancements, or recruitment expeditions, uh, she got nothing from those. So right now, that basically ends her current record at zero wins, as well as two losses for the Vernon Tribunal of the Judges. Now onto the victors with the Stygian Legion. So just like Smells Like Febreze, he actually, my buddy Big Puka, actually suffered four casualties in this battle report. 
for Abaddon, Cobal, as well as Skull Smasher, all three of those guys will no effect. However, Shabriri, the Spine Demon, though, actually rolled a Twisted result, so because of that, he actually lost one point in his cool, but earned one point of his life, so that part was kind of neat. Now, for the wards, they actually managed to secure three bonus souls from all the souls they were able to capture. At the same time, from the number of soul dice they actually uh, secure, they actually raise up 24 souls from that as well, bringing their grand total to 27. At the same time, we rolled up on the rewards table, we actually rolled no rewards at this time, and at the same time, also received no titles as well. Now for advancements, Abaddon the leader actually leveled up to level 5, uh, not level 5, leveled up to 5 experience, so because of that, he earns plus 1 to his combat score, bringing his combat score up to an 8. Now for recruitment expeditions, uh, my friend Big Puka decided not to invest in any of that, decided to keep his souls instead. His current record now is at 2 wins as well as 0 losses. So that's good for this one, guys, for Battle Part number 5 for our Rain and Hell campaign. As always, please feel free to like, comment, and or subscribe. Your guys' input is available to us as always. Also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, as well as blogger.com for all the latest, greatest hobby news related to our channel. That's good for this one, you guys. We'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace out and stay classy.